Today on the Uncomfortable Podcast, we have Bill Lederer. Bill was introduced to me by my good friend and fellow domain broker, Alan Dunn, who is the owner of Namecorp. Bill and I spoke over the phone and realized that he lived about 45 minutes away from my house. We decided to meet in person, and for the record, I have never recorded a thing in my life, but I bought a high-end camera and brought it with me for the interview. It might look a little bit like a deposition, but I did the best I could. Bill was working a corporate job and moved back home to Chicago to take over his family art supply business that had a handful of employees that was not online. Now, it was the 90s, so who was? Bill had big plans and aspirations for the business, but it took a radio interview in Rockefeller Plaza where, after a one-hour discussion, the DJ could not remember his company name. That's when he knew it was time for a change. The problem was that those who had invested in his company did not see the same benefits, the perfect domain name, would bring to their business. Additionally, Bill had to find a way to convince the current owner of Art.com to sell it to him. Hear his story and how this decision, amongst others, ended up leading to a $200 million plus dollar exit. This is one hell of a story. I loved recording every minute of it. Thanks for listening. Today on a very special episode of the Uncomfortable Podcast, I have traveled to St. Petersburg to meet Bill Lederer, founder and founder and the leader of iSocrates as chairman and CEO. He is a global C-level digital media and marketing services executive with extensive consulting, founding, building, turnaround expertise in both entrepreneurial and established companies in mad tech, programmatic trading, data and analytics, advanced TV, and online and mobile video. Internet and e-commerce, advertising, marketing, and information services. That's a lot of things. <laughs> Bill has served as a divisional CEO and or C-level executive with Kantar, WPP, TNS, and Getty Images. He was a founder and CEO of eTaylorArt.com. We're certainly going to talk about that. And a programmatic media trader, Media Crossing, and is a former board member for public and private companies, including WPP Digital, Kantar Digital, Rewards Network, major universities, and nonprofits. He has an extensive work experience in the Americas, Europe, India, and Israel, and he was an adjunct professor at the New School Graduate Program in Media Management and is the co author of the leading industry textbook, Media Selling, the fifth edition. You're a very accomplished man, and um, you know, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Looking forward to it. All right. So, you know, there's a lot to go over here, and as we talked about before um, starting the show, is that we like to kind of hear a little bit about your background and then and then get into what you know you're up to now. So, you know, someone like yourself, I think a lot of people don't really always see the struggle to get where you are, and they see C level titles, and they see you know. You're a professor at a college, a, uh, a very accomplished author. You know, you've started a lot of um, very popular businesses. You ran Getty Images for a period of time. You know, why don't you tell us your story about how you got there and how you accomplished a lot of these things? Well, let's see. Uh, thank you. Let's see. It doesn't feel like I've accomplished a lot of things. It definitely feels like I'm on this journey mm -hmm. and I had a lot of experiences. Um, Let's see, I think all of this began uh, a little bit out of a state of envy and curiosity. Um, for me as a digital entrepreneur, this really started by watching a fellow who was working at a firm similar to one that I had been working at on Wall Street, um, where he and his wife left to uh, go to Seattle to go sell books on the World Wide Web. And uh, I saw that happening in real time and uh, saw uh, Bezos stand up Amazon and start selling books. And I'm scratching my head saying, I get where this is going, the ARPANET to the World Wide Web, but books, you know, what's, what's he thinking? Like, hey, boy, it doesn't, that's not intuitively obvious to me. And then it became way more obvious. And then as Amazon went from books and began to go to uh, CD uh, ROMs with uh, music and uh, DVDs. It, it immediately, I, I think I understood that business model and where that was going and said, okay, 
what would be another category that perhaps would have higher margins and a little bit more uh, barriers to entry that might be another attractive area within B to C where I could leverage skills that I had um, developed uh, working on Wall Street, uh, being a quant, uh, doing uh, data and analytics and working with technology. And uh, uh, I picked prints and posters. I thought that the web was not intrinsically text-based, but that instead with ultimately ubiquitous uh, bandwidth available and having it be very cheap, which I thought would be the case, that it's really sight, sound, and motion. It was just a matter of time for this to evolve. When Amazon started, people thought, well, this is a text-based medium. I'm like, no, 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 it's not text. It's going to be sight, sound, and motion. It's just a question of how fast this can be, this innovation can diffuse across society. And uh, I picked prints and posters. I picked something visual uh, where you needed a lot of selection, where the supply chain didn't quite uh, already exist to be able to do fast uh, fulfillment. And um, uh, where there's a little bit more barrier to entry. And uh, I was very fortunate I got in early. But I didn't get in with art.com. Like a lot of entrepreneurs, virtually all of us, we learn by making mistakes. Uh, very few of us come out with perfect business plans <laughs> and, they, and they're you know, executed flawlessly and it works exactly the way that you thought that it would. Very rarely does that happen. So in my case, I started artuframe.com and uh, it was pretty how, good. How would you spell that? Sorry to interrupt. A-R-T-U-F-R-A-M-E.com. Okay. And uh, the time frame was May 5th of 1998. Okay. And um, we launched, and very quickly we discovered that uh, people were not comfortable to use a credit card to make a purchase on the internet. Mm -hmm. And boy, it sure takes a long time to load these images online if you're a consumer and how many clicks you had to go through to get through the shopping cart to make a purchase. Yeah and they may or may not have an email address and let's just say that these were early days on the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. uh, not to mention the fact that I was running another company at the same time and so my wife was putting up with me uh, letting me essentially reinvest uh, our limited resources into this this new business and we did a very steady five orders a day on average through the course of the late spring and summer of uh, 1998. So speaking of your wife, real quick, and, and sorry to interrupt. So you were in, in New York as a quant. So you were doing... I was in Connecticut as a quant. Okay. I wound up moving to Chicago to look after uh, my family business uh, and my dad, who was getting sicker and sicker. And when I came up with this idea of artuframe.com, I was living in the northern suburbs of Chicago. So when you were obviously probably making a, a quite a decent living, you're an intelligent person in the corporate world, you know, working in a financial institution, and you go to your wife or you say, I want to quit and open an art business, which, yep. were you involved in art at the time, or were you just kind of studying it? Was it on a whim? I was involved with art supplies and picture framing materials, which was our family business. It was not prints and posters. Uh -huh. but. Prints and posters are often sold where art supplies and picture framing is sold. So I was aware of it as a tangential part of my professional life. So when your your father became ill, did you take over his business and help him during that time? Is that I, kind of right? I absolutely did, uh, not knowing that he was ill with a terminal illness and that I was going to lose him shortly, so had no idea. What I did know was that I would go to see my customers, who were largely retailers, um, sometimes mail order catalogs, wholesalers. Invariably, I would watch consumers having a tough experience in stores uh, and with mail order companies. And uh, I would observe and say, oh, like, you know, I think the internet could probably do this a whole lot better. And I would make that observation quietly to myself, talk to my customers and say, have you thought about having a presence on the internet? And 100% of the clients said, what are you, crazy? <laughs> no one's ever gonna buy this online for any number of reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, you know, uh, there's a lot of success right now in the book business on the internet. Why wouldn't prints and posters and framing of prints and posters be done online? But no one shared my interest or enthusiasm for the likelihood that that would happen. Okay. And 
And when you brought this up to your father or when you're taking over the business that you were going to kind of bring it online or to other family members, what did they think about it? That would never have been a possibility. First of all, um, my father passed away in 1996, so this would have been the beginning of Amazon, and, and uh, I wouldn't have talked about it with him. But my father was a Depression-era guy, and the idea that you would be involved with a negative cash flow startup <laughs> Uh, with the idea that somebody would be making these uh, purchase decisions on the World Wide Web that just that they really wouldn't fit for somebody who had come from that generation. So in some ways, I, I really didn't want to lose my dad uh, and my business partner under any circumstances, but the fact that he wasn't there to say no and would allow me to be able to reinvest my earnings in this crazy enterprise it wouldn't have happened while my dad was still around, and I'm too respectful of a son to, that I I would have um, I wouldn't have um, gone against his his uh, demand that I stick to the way the business had always always been done. So he wasn't there to say no, and my mother, as it turns out, was there to say yes. Mm -hmm. So my mother uh, heard what I was interested in and she said oh this makes perfect sense to me there's just uh, two things on the first is I said oh great mom so you're supportive oh yeah she said I think you're really built for this whatever this industry is going to be this is this is you but there's just two things I said yes and she said well the first one is don't screw up the family business we work awfully hard to get it to where it is and so don't don't mess that up and the other is please don't ask me for any money yeah <laughs> So there you go. At least she was very upfront and honest about that one. Well, that was always my mother. So we got started with Art You Frame, and uh, I think your listeners might appreciate this. I had a seminal moment, one of those, one of those um, uh, lightning strike moments that really uh, was very inspirational. And, and the story is this. It was uh, September of uh, 1998. I think beginning of September, and I was doing, I just finished an interview with CBS Radio Network in New York. I was at Black Rock on, on uh, Sixth Avenue, and the uh, uh, interview had gone fine. The interviewer said, you know, uh, you're really great at this. You, this seems to be an industry you're really comfortable with, you're, you're a fun interview, and I really wish you good luck with, now he just spent the last hour talking to me about Art You Frame at artuframe.com. I'm getting on the on an elevator. The elevator doors are closing, and he's stammering. He cannot remember the name of the internet site that that I run that he'd just been interviewing me for an hour about. Wow. <laughs> so as the doors close, I realize I have a brand problem, and I said to myself, "I am not getting off this elevator until I fix this problem. Because if this guy can't remember, that means nobody else is going to remember either." And um, all I can say is... Um, Luckily, that, the, the building was 80 stories tall because you had time to think about it, was. I was on an upper floor. I had the time to think it through. And as the elevator doors opened, I got that look from New Yorkers waiting to get on the elevator. That, that's a famous look that anybody who's ever been to New York has had, which is sort of that insistence of, hey, you're holding me up, you know, yep. uh, you're in my way because I'm not getting out of the elevator. I'm still thinking through the resolution. And finally, what comes to me is, it's art, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. He remembered the art. He didn't remember the U-frame. Just keep it simple. It's art, art.com, that's it. And so these people are looking at me. Doors open, I'm on the ground floor. It's time for me to get out, and on my mind is, get to a phone. So I get out of there, people look at me, give me a dirty look as they're getting into the elevator. And I go out, and this will tell you how long ago it was. I walk out onto Avenue of the Americas, uh, 6th Avenue, mm -hmm. and, and I uh, go to a payphone. Remember payphones? Oh, yeah, I remember those. <laughs> yep. So I go to a payphone. Uh, I made a collect call to the office back in Chicago, and I said, Who owns art.com? And that began uh, an ordeal. So before the ordeal begins, to paint the picture for everybody listening, including myself. When you made that phone call and you said you called the office, how many people worked for you, do you think, at that time? At Art You Frame, we probably had about uh, maybe 20 people. Maybe total. 20. Maybe 20. Maybe 18 to 20. And before you went online, was it about the same size company and working with the no, vendors? Or no, it was smaller. Smaller business. Because we weren't in the art and framing business. We were in the art supplies and picture framing materials business. 
that's a business that was structured very differently. So it was a smaller business. Okay, and then were you sourcing the things you were selling online from the people that you were selling to before and using the community, or we, no? We weren't online at all. There was no online presence. I had no experience online. I had never done anything online. Not a, I hadn't bought, I hadn't sold, nothing. I'd spent a lot of time on porn sites <laughs> and CDW and CD Universe and Dell and a few others, but I, I really was not an internet person until that, that time that I um, spent getting Art Uframe online. Uh huh. And uh, all right, so you call the office, and who's in the office that you called at the time? What was oh, the structure of the business? I should clarify. The reason I was on the porn site I was going to say it <laughs> was strictly for the business. I was there to study the business models. That's it. I mean, things that I've read is that porn has been a pretty big. Um, industry that has advanced the internet immensely, I think, with, with video and pictures and downloading and yes, it hosting seems, and things like that. It, it's been very... It seems that way. Yeah, of course. It's always about research. So you call your your co uh, like a co-worker, or who is the person that you called in the office to say, find me the owner of, of art.com? I called... I'm not sure who I called. I called somebody in the office. They looked it up in the ICANN registry to determine you know, uh, who had the domain. And it turned out it was something called Advanced Rotorcraft Technology. And I'm thinking, Advanced Rotorcraft, it's a helicopter consulting business doing defense industry consulting. And I'm like, I got it, A-R-T. Like, that's crazy. Oh, well, they're clearly not benefiting from the highest and best use of that domain. Yep. So I uh, called California and uh, um, Advanced Rotorcraft Technology. I said, may I speak to the president? And the immediate response I got is, our URL is not for sale. Stop bothering us. And I said, oh, wait a minute. I'm, I don't know what this is concerning, but I'm, I'm trying to speak to the president of the helicopter consulting firm. I don't know what, what you're saying. She said, people bother us all the time. They call here and they, they want to buy our domain and, and URL, and it's not for sale. And I said, well, that, that's good to know, but that's not why I'm calling, uh -huh. which is, of course, why I was calling. Yeah. <laughs> but clearly I was going to get past her if I said, oh, that's, that's unfortunate. Yep. So instead I get through, and a fellow says, you know, hello, he introduces himself, and I said, you know, before, before I talk to you about uh, the purpose I'm, I'm calling, I said it was a curious thing. I called... And I hear that, uh, you know, your URL is not for sale. And I said, what's that all about? So he begins to tell me the story that he had registered the domain when it was ARPANET. And he was doing work in the defense industry. Never occurred to him that this would have any commercial value. But as the Internet began to um, become a uh, viable um, uh, channel for, for media and marketing, all of a sudden people seemed to care. So in time frame, this is 1998. And uh, he said, uh, this is just a nuisance. And he said, man, he said, uh, every single day, I said, oh, so it's really disruptive to the business. He goes, yeah. He said, you know, we're like a helicopter consulting firm. We get maybe a phone call a day. But with these guys, they call all the time. It's really a problem. I said, oh, uh, that, that's unfortunate. I said, well, you should probably get rid of the problem so it make your life easier. And he goes, well, how the hell am I going to do that? And I said, I don't know, get rid of the domain, I guess. And he goes, yeah, I could do that. But he said, my email is tied to the domain. And I said, well, I'm sure somebody could give you like a, a redirect. And he said, yeah, it's sort of a pain in the neck. I said, which is a bigger pain in the neck, to set up a redirect of an email, uh, forwarding email, or or um, this, these constant uh, calls that you're getting. And he goes, yeah, they send me email too, and they're really bothering me, and they'll, they send mail. And I said, well, it seems to me that you ought to try to get rid of the, the nuisance. And he goes, well, how would you do that? And I said, I don't know, accept one of their offers. He goes, yeah, he goes, I don't know how much it's worth, but it's got to be a lot. He goes, he, I said, well, how much traffic do you get? Well, he knew his traffic, and he told me. And I did some quick math, and I'm like, Okay, this is one of the most valuable domains in the world. Uh, interesting. The, the, the price that would be paid essentially is like buying permanent advertising. You're going to get all this traffic. Yep. So I said, well, maybe I could help you out. And he goes, and, and how? 
And I said, I, you know what, I'll, I'll buy the domain from you. I'll take it off your hands. And he goes, really? You would do that? And I said, well, I, how much do you want for it? And he said, oh, well, geez, it's, it's got to be worth, I don't know, at least half a million dollars. I'm like, that's nuts. That's a crazy number. And it actually wasn't that crazy because of the amount of traffic it was getting. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, they weren't doing anything to promote it. It wasn't, you know, they weren't selling anything there that was relevant. And he goes, well, of course, yeah, no, I'd, I'd take less than that. So we, we worked on um, what that number might be. He still has no idea why I'm calling. He thinks I'm <laughs> calling about something to do with the helicopter. And he goes, but, but you're not going to pay me that kind of money. I said, you know what I'll do? I'll wire you $10,000 right now for a non-refundable deposit, uh, giving me the option to purchase at that price for a limited period of time. Because you do that. He said, yeah, I mean, I said, uh, do you have a good use for $10,000? He goes, yeah. He said, he goes, but you, don't you want to talk about helicopters? And I said, well, let's, let's finish this discussion first. <laughs> so we work it out. And I said, so do we have a deal? And he said, yeah, put it in writing. He said, but I'm a man of my word. And he said, you send me the money and you send me the paperwork. He goes, okay, now, why did you call? And I said, well, I hate to sound like a total scoundrel, <laughs> but it occurs to me that, um, uh, this is really a good idea, this art.com. And he goes, well, do you have a business that you would use it? And I said, not yet, but I'm hopeful. But I said, I'm a man of my word. And I literally got off the phone. I sent him the $10,000 simultaneously sending him the contract. I'm not sure which got there first, uh, but I took care of both of them at the same time. So at this, at this point in time, you know, you took over your dad's business. You're yep. growing it into something from five to 20 people. You know, yep. you're going down to New York doing a radio show, yep. talking about it, right? Yep. So you obviously had momentum. You're totally all in on the business. Yes. This is 1999, 98. 98. 98. Yep. How the hell were you going to come up with 490,000 more dollars after you sent him? Yeah, well, uh, we agreed on a number under 500,000, but it was uh, north of $450,000. Okay, but how did, you know, even like even okay. now, that's yes. a boatload of cash. Good question. Up. All right, so what do you do when you don't have the money to purchase something yeah. uh, that's a value and there's a sort of a story associated with it? Well, if you're, a, if you're a digital entrepreneur, you're a creative person who doesn't take no easily and who has a lot of passion and, um, and stick-to-itiveness. So I wrote a business plan and uh, I got my ass out to California and I was fortunate to have Benchmark and SoftBank um, agree to fund a business where use of proceeds would include the purchase of the art.com name. And uh, that was how I would pay for it, that I would have other people's money pay for um, allowing me to exercise the option to buy the domain. So that's how I figured I would do it. It was gonna be using other people's money in the context of a business plan, taking art you frame to another level. So how does a, um, how does a person from Chicago, who isn't in the circles of VCs, yes. an art guy, yep. get to two of the bigger VCs in the world, probably yep. the most popular ones, even get an appointment and then get them to give yep. you money. How really, does that even happen? That's an excellent question, thank you. So this is not easy. You're gonna have to be prepared to hear no or get no response, where they go completely silent, or sometimes they say yes and then they say no, or they just go silent after saying yes. There's a lot of bumps along the way. Um, in my case, it was cold outreach to Benchmark. There really was no other way to do this, um, both for myself and uh, someone that I hired. We basically um, blitzed uh, Benchmark, focusing on getting their attention. Interestingly enough, they have a different view of things. Uh, I think the, those principles of Benchmark today would say, oh, well, you know, we, we thought of this. We, we came up with this, with this idea. And, you know, we found this guy. But I have a different memory of it. And my memory was a constant barrage of outreach to get their attention, which ultimately um, ended up in a phone call in, in a meeting. And... Um, uh, 
interestingly enough, they really weren't paying much attention to the idea of buying the art.com name. I didn't know that. I thought that this was going to be like one of my key assets. Yeah. It turns out that that's actually not what they were thinking. Um, they made their name and their money in fund number one investing in eBay. So in the case of eBay, what does eBay mean? It could mean anything. So their thought was, well, you don't need to have a special name or URL to be successful in the consumer internet. Yeah. The product and the consumer experience should be enough. When I disagreed. I thought this is a case where we had the right brand at the right time. So what wound up happening was that uh, we were able to close on the financing. By the way, we got SoftBank because Benchmark introduced us to SoftBank. Benchmark accepted and then declined the deal and introduced us to SoftBank. Mm -hmm. SoftBank called Benchmark and said, thank you very much. We love the guy. We love the deal. We want the whole thing. We'll take your allocation as well as our own and and then Benchmark said well, the hell with that it's our deal <laughs> <laughs> so we wound up having the two of them uh, which worked out fine until we had the first board meeting and at the first board meeting our Benchmark partner said I've thought about it and I really don't think the money should be used to buy the URL so I don't support using our money to buy the URL let's go all in on television which is definitely the way it was in the 90s without <laughs> a doubt in, in the, this, to give everyone an idea, we're talking about the fourth quarter of 1998. Among other things, that period of time was known as the beginning of um, uh, Black Friday. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning of this, this huge uh, online push for uh, Christmas shopping. But at the time, the general feeling was, well, um, we we'll use traditional methods, and I thought, no, 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 no. Like we've already proven that digital advertising and digital marketing works for our for for our business. Mm -hmm. But you've got the ability to buy this block of traffic and this name, and this is extremely valuable and way undervalued at that price. It was very clear that we had, we had a complete win, but it was every it was clear to everyone except our board of directors. Most of the board members thought, well, you know, television, that's what other people are doing. It's what eBay was going to be doing. We'll go with TV. And this was a case where um, the, the charismatic visionary founding CEO who actually had a control of the board from a voting standpoint said, yeah, we're going the other way. We're not doing television. We're going to buy the art.com name and we're going to be a a marketing presence, not not uh, spending so much time and, and effort and money offline. The, that purchase of Art.com was the making of that business, and subsequently in the various um, versions of Art.com as a business that have happened subsequently, I would say it certainly is a very key asset. So, at that time, I don't know, I'm, I'm too young to remember how VCs were then. But today, when I hear about a VC investing in a company, it's usually not anything to do with artwork, because artwork like that, posters, frames, and things like that, isn't very sexy, it's not a new technology, it's yeah. kind of, I don't want to say it's boring, but it's just a standard, regular business. And so if they're not going to let you run with the domain, why would they even bother to give you money when any other art, larger art supplier out there they could just go and work with them with more of an established business model and, and more shops carrying and more, you know, more power behind it and a more experienced management team. That's what I don't understand. So at that moment, if you think about what looked like it was successful on the internet in these B2C companies, it didn't appear that the name was going to be that important. Mm -hmm. It was more like, did you have first mover advantage? Okay. Did you have focus? Did you have a, a, an extreme maniacal focus on the, on the customer experience? Back then, more established companies were thought to be more like an anchor. And so, for example, why would Michaels be more successful at this than, than we were? There are many reasons why those more traditional retailers move too slowly. You know, why didn't Barnes & Noble catch up to Amazon and beat Amazon in the book business? It never got close. So I think that the story then as it is now is a small group of incredibly focused individuals 
In my case, I had some domain expertise within that particular industry, but I mean, I was working 18 hours a day, every day, seven days a week, completely and totally focused on absolute customer joy. Uh, we had an incredibly positive um, experience from the consumer standpoint, mm -hmm. and that really drove the business. It wasn't the advertising. We were very good at affiliate marketing and other things, but I would say it was the execution of the model. It was pretty flawless. Um, tough from a profitability standpoint in the near term, it became a very profitable business, but like many internet companies, it had to go through that, that, uh, that very early uh, discovery process. But by the end of the first year, we were hitting 14 million in run rate revenue, and the business was clearly on fire. The, ultimately, we monetized by selling to Getty Images um, in a stock transaction. Um, but the alternative was to go to a B round, which was heavily oversubscribed in a nine-figure pre-money valuation. God bless them. <laughs> so let's back up a little bit. Um, so you get art.com. You have the board meeting. You get what you want. You know, you're the petulant young guy <laughs> with the older, the older board that you said, nope, we're going to do it my way. Yeah. You get the name. How long did it take for you to prove that you were right? When did you start to see the numbers? Well, it was actually very, change. I was very fortunate. So um, basically within 30 days, I had complete total proof positive that, that we're headed in the right direction. A lot of it had to do with timing. So by the time we had the board meeting and I executed the purchase of the domain in full, we uh, did some redesign of the website, which was already underway. Mm -hmm. uh, we bought a database called Art Print Index that allowed us to be able to uh, be really the only uh, comprehensive uh, database of all the prints and posters published in the world uh, that allowed us to be both a wholesaler and a retailer. Um, when we put those pieces together, it was all within 30 days, and we had October Sorry, we hit uh, Thanksgiving of 1998. The day after Thanksgiving, all the DNSs around the world updated from Art Uframe to art.com. We did 500 orders that day after Thanksgiving of 98. Mm -hmm. We did 15 orders the previous 24 hour cycle. Oh, wow. <laughs> the website never did less than 500 orders a day from then on. Um, so it was a very, very fortunate experience. A lot of good things happened. And we knew within 30 days we, we had a total win on our hands. So then as an entrepreneur, the next two challenges become, okay, we need to go raise a new round. And the immediate response from the board was, we're not going to accept less than a nine-figure pre-money value because you clearly have got a, a big win here for us. Um, that was one challenge, so now I've got to go focus on going out and telling the story uh, to a new group of people as opposed to running my business. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so second issue is if we became an apparent success to everybody else as well, so then you're getting everybody in the world wants to do business with you, including wanting to acquire you. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this massive distraction to, hey, I'm just at the beginning of trying to build my business and I've got all this stuff I want to execute in the coming year. So... Uh, had a lot, of, a lot of ambitious folks around us um, and a lot of options, a lot of ways that we could have gone wrong, but we got, we got lucky again in terms of steering towards a good outcome. The ultimate challenge in that period of time became um, the board really would like to do another round, a B round, um, with a monster valuation. And I had come from Wall Street before all this and have a pretty good sense of cycles and and uh, the lack of, the, the danger of extrapolating on things. Mm -hmm. And I said, if we do a B round, these people are gonna need a venture-like return on their investment. How likely is it that we're gonna get public or sold within a few years that's gonna give them that return? In what's the likelihood of that? And then sort of, what, if we don't do it, what's the implication? And I looked at the stock market and I said, the market's not gonna stay like this, this incredible B to C frenzy that was going on in 99. And I said, I don't think this is gonna last more than a year or two at most. And it looks like I'm gonna be the last guy out of the boat. Um, 
Meanwhile, I had been looking at Getty Images as a company, and I'm like, oh my God, this company is so well positioned to do well in a digital economy, but they have three or four things they need to accomplish. Maybe I could help them to accelerate the transition that they need to go through. So one plus one equals three. That might be an interesting stock to have, and I wonder if I could help them to make that transition, um, and if I'd be better off to be a minority shareholder in a public company that's got solid revenue, profitability, mm -hmm. um, and, and is going to benefit from tremendous positive transformation. So we ran this process where uh, we're looking at these different alternatives. There was no investment banker, it's just me and the, the board figuring things out. And um, we wound up going with Getty Images. Uh, the business was sold. For those of us that took the stock and held it, we wound up exiting an evaluation that wound up being worth uh, just under a quarter of a billion dollars for a business that did two million in revenue in the first 12, min 12 uh, months in business. Wow. And we sold it on the one year anniversary, exactly the one year anniversary of the day we started taking revenue. What do you think your dad would have said about that? Well, I think he would have had me sell the business a hell of a lot earlier. You think so? Definitely. I don't think he would have he would have seen the risk that I had to take every day in that business and say, oh my God, what are you doing? I'll give you a small example. Um, one of the things about uh, the Bezos set as a standard for the rest of us was that consumers thought that if they placed an order, they should get it shipped pretty much immediately. Yep. They weren't thinking about what's this happening with the supply chain. They just figured the logistics are it ships right away. Well, let me just tell you, if you're going to have 120,000 prints and posters uh, in your database that's fuelable by the consuming public, and they want to put a credit card through, and they think they're going to get something immediately, you better be a genius, because otherwise you're going to go out of business on the working capital requirement of carrying the inventory, because at that time, the distributors didn't carry inventory. A distributor in the print and poster business meant that you had the right to resell something. But typically, they weren't sitting on physical goods, or at least an extremely limited inventory. So you had huge supply chain issues about how are you going to get from the original uh, image uh, to something that was shippable the same day or the next day to the client by UPS or FedEx. And uh, there, there were a lot of things there that we had to figure out in order to be able to make this work. Essentially, you don't want to choke on your working capital, your inventory. Um, so what, how do you know what merchandise to carry when nobody's ever done this before? So there were things, that, because I had come from the domain where I had a leg up from the beginning on the deals I negotiated, the inventory we carried, what we didn't carry, what we had other people carry for us, mm -hmm. um, lots of things like that. How, did, how do you ship a single framed piece of art without it breaking? Yeah, I mean, how would you say, how would you, you know, like an 80 inch, Diagonal or 60 inch piece Forget, of artwork. Yeah, to somebody. for just even a 24 by 36. That's that alone. When I first entered the business, UPS and FedEx wouldn't give me an account to ship. They wouldn't give anybody an account to ship a single frame piece of art. They, they wouldn't allow it. That was the standard corporate rule. Was no, there's too much data breakage. Yeah. So I, I worked with a cupcake company to acquire a domain, and I asked, "Why aren't you shipping more?" And they said, "It's an absolute nightmare shipping cupcakes because most of the time they get the cupcakes and the frosting is a mess, <laughs> and then the customer it's, complains." And you yes. say, "Well, how the hell are we supposed to ship cupcakes unless yes. you freeze them? Yes. But if you freeze them, they don't work. It, it, people don't like thawing out cupcakes." I, I can tell you that there were hundreds of these uh, things that occurred along the way. Um, I, in the beginning, I couldn't get uh, people who were um, uh, publishers in the print and poster business to actually uh, give me a commercial account. They thought that if they, if I scanned the images and put them online, somebody would uh, scan or take down the, J, uh, the JPEG and reproduce it themselves, and they wouldn't buy it. I said, do you have any idea what the quality of that is? It doesn't work that way. Yeah. But that's what they thought. Then they thought, well, you know, um, you're going to cherry pick us. You only pick the, you know, the best of our things. And I said, no, I'll take everything. Give me everything that you've got. And then they thought, oh, well, there must be a scam involved. The only way that we could start the business, after 29 days of trying to get the leading publishers to supply us, and none of them would, was we had to agree to take every image of one particular publisher had. We would scan it, annotate it. It would be in the available in the database. 
And he said, no matter what I send you, it has to be there. And I said, absolutely. So he sends me everything that he's got, and we've got to scan it uh, and put it online. Well, um, about one out of every 20 images was completely pornographic. Are you kidding? Hardcore, hardcore gay porn. Wow. Had no idea. <laughs> Had absolutely no idea. So uh, about a week later, he said, well, where are we? I said, it's all done. And he said, I don't see it online. I'm on your website. I don't see it. He said, I'm going to let everybody in the industry know, you know, you're not a man of your word. And I said, no, it's there. I said, give me a SKU number. So he gives me a SKU number. I type it in. And I said, it's right there. And he goes, what are you talking about? I said, type it in. And he goes, oh. He said, well, how come I can't find it? I said, well, that's not my problem. It's on there. He goes, wait a minute. He said, it's on there? Well, if I type in so-and-so, he goes, it doesn't come up. And I said, oh, well, I guess it's not annotated in the database to be able to do that. But I said, if they know what they're looking for, they'll find it. Yeah. He goes, oh, you're a very tricky guy. Yeah. And I said, I'm a man of my word. I did exactly what I said I would agree to do. Do you think he's trying to sabotage you in some way, or what do you think it was? No, he was having trouble getting distribution for his pornographic posters. Okay. So he was he was he was trying to find an alternative distribution channel. Okay. And so, uh, but he said, he goes, you are a man of your word. He said, you're a very good businessman. He said, it's okay, you can use, you can use our name. So I immediately recontacted all the people that turned us down and I said, we have uh, this extremely well-known uh, distributor uh, 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 who were now carrying their, their images. And uh, they said, oh, okay. And so we got pretty much everybody else. But man, those first 29 days in business, that was tough. We didn't have the art.com name. We didn't, you know, we, uh, UPS and FedEx wouldn't give me accounts because I was shipping out of my home. And at that time, you weren't allowed to be able to do commercial shipments out of a home. Oh, really? Yes, they wouldn't because the truck wouldn't come. And then when they did come, they said, oh, this is a frame piece of art. We can't do individual frame pieces. So I had to re-engineer everything to figure out how to ship it without breaking it. And you have to make money. So anybody can do something, can redesign a package so it doesn't break. But you have to do it in such a way that it's actually, you can make money. Because you, if you over-engineer it, all the money, will, all the profit will be tied up in the packaging. Um, so there's tons of those issues. The rebranding of the business was absolutely critically important to the success of the business um, in that period of time. And it became an incredibly important asset. Should I have sold the name instead of leasing the name when we sold the business and sort of kept a long-term right to the name? <coughs> That's a possibility. It wasn't in my thinking at the time to do sort of a Hong Kong lease, hold the name, lease it for 99 years, and have it come back to me in 100 years. I guess that's something that we could have done, but uh, no, no regrets. The, the power of a name, but boy, the, the real test was not that. The real test was for me as a founding CEO to sit in a board meeting, our first board meeting, where there was a real test of the confidence the board had in me and for me to say, no, we're not going to spend the money on television. We're going to buy this URL. When at that time there was really no proof statement that that was going to be such an um, important factor in the success of the business. Yeah, I mean, but you obviously did it with such conviction, and they believed in you to get you to that point anyway. So you deserve to be there. You earned yeah. their respect and obviously their money to do it. Yeah, and, but, but I think the only reason it really happened, this is for those of you that are, are founders, it was because I negotiated in the uh, investment uh, for the Series A that I had two votes instead of one vote on matters like this until we got to the B round. And I think that that, my sticking to my guns with the attorney for the lead VC on this topic, I think turned out to be a really important thing. Um, I feel like um, sometimes the source of the money is not always right. Sometimes the guy who's closest to running the business um, may have insight that others don't. And I felt like, hey, I better hold that vote just in case I, you know, I may need that vote. So. I can compromise on other things, but I can't compromise on that. Yeah. Um, let's back up slightly. Uh, you mentioned the beginning of the interview that people were having a hard time using their credit card yeah. on your site, right? Or and, any site. Or yeah. any site. Yeah. 
did you see conversions change immensely from, I mean, if you're looking at your website and trying to make the customers ecstatically happy for 18 yeah. hours a day, yeah. one of the metrics you must be looking at is abandonment. Correct. So right. the, in that particular website, I was really looking at two things. So definitely abandonment is one, but the other is, did they leave any breadcrumbs behind in the form of saving the framed piece of art or the images that they were interested in in the gallery? So um, one of the things that I sort of created and invented with that business was that you could select your uh, picture, pick your framing options, you could save it and come back to it later. And um, what we saw was people were abandoning for sure, but they were setting up a, a password protected gallery, which they were coming back to mm -hmm. and coming back to. And one of the challenges with getting the venture capital money was they said, what's wrong with you? You have all these people who are saving things and they're coming back, but they're not buying. I mean, like, why, why do you not know how to do your job better? Yeah. Cause, and I said, I think it's consumer psychology. I think there's actually, they need to show it to their spouses or friends and that they, they, you know, they want other people to see and they're thinking about it. It's a considered purchase. Yeah. And they haven't, many of these people have never bought online or if they bought, maybe they bought a book or something. And I said, I don't, I think it's actually just, it's, um, it, we're building up a, kind of a deferred momentum that, that's, it's, it's gonna happen. And during that time, I came up with the phrase that it was a, it was a rubber band uh, airplane um, economics. And they said, the, what, what does that mean? And I said, well, you know, when you hold like one of these balsa wood uh, airplanes, it's got a rubber band in the chassis, mm -hmm. and it's connected to the propeller, and you're turning the propeller over and over again, you're holding that chassis, and the rubber band is twisting and twisting, and it's building up this kinetic energy. It's, it's, it's sitting still, but what is happening is it's building up this energy that gets converted into thrust. When you take your hand off the chassis and you let go of the propeller, that thing is going to take off. Uh -huh. Now, it's not apparent to anybody other than maybe the person who's watching and, and holding this thing that that's what's going on, but this energy is getting converted. I think that's what happens sometimes with consumers. It's, it's people who are not yet ready to buy. They're getting ready to buy. And the challenge for all of us as entrepreneurs is sort of, you know, what does it take to encourage them? How do you induce the behavior that, that you're seeking? And sometimes it's a social thing. Sometimes it's a budget thing, circumstances, absolute need. Um, there are all kinds of uh, motivators. But in this particular case, it turned out that what we know with the benefit of hindsight, in the fourth quarter of 1998, that was the e-commerce introduction. That was the first time when um, business to consumer e-commerce really took off. It became a, a thing. Mm -hmm. So it turns out all that hard work that I had put in in the previous year and a half, the negative cash flow, the challenges, the, the um, internal second guessing, all that, you know, the nudges I got from people, the, oh, Bill, you know, he's, you know, he's crazy. It, that, that payoff came, and usually it takes quite a long time for that to happen. Mm -hmm. It just happened in that period of time. It was, it was, uh, it, it all came together. And it would be easy to say that it's just the name, just the domain. But the domain was the fertile ground on which everything else was built. Yeah, but it also takes the management team to execute and sure. make it happen. Yep. So when you talked about spending the $450,000 for art.com, right, and then you did the raise, mm -hmm. how much was the raise and like what percentage of the budget sure. did art.com take up? Because I think that sometimes domain investors who we're trying to acquire a domain from yep. will see that this company has raised $5 million. And so they're saying, oh, well, they could easily spend 20% on Sure. domain that, that they want from me and it's like well no they can't you know or yeah. you know so what what is a fair what was the pr proportion for you guys so I'm doing this from memory but yeah. I think um, we're looking at uh, pre-money value was probably around eight and a half million we've raised maybe eleven and a half million um, let's assume that we spent uh, four hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the domain 
So uh, of the 11 and a half million we're spending uh, uh, 450,000 on the, on the domain. 5% or so, okay. Yeah, 5%. Or another way of looking at it in terms of the traffic, it would be, <laughs> back then the big uh, thing that people were doing were in, uh, spending money with AOL. Yep. You were becoming a, a, a partner of, of AOL. <laughs> yeah, maybe you'd be like a, a, a leader within a, a particular channel or, or um, merchandise category. What I spent was the equivalent of being a one-year partner of AOL in the, uh, if there was an art, art and framing channel, which there wasn't at the time, but if there was an art and framing channel, it would be like spending a year of that money with AOL. Oh, wow. So yeah. it, was a, it was a relative bargain. Um, I think the key thing is uh, it was the right name at the right time and where the name was the category, it's, it's um, you know, it just, uh, it, there, there's a lot of alignment there. I mention this because we're going to talk about another uh, um, area within um, the internet, which is artificial intelligence. And there's, there are moments in time when um, uh, there's very fertile ground available. It may not have been available and interesting and, and valuable before, and maybe not even two years later, but sometimes there's a moment. And I think that you can agree that we're living in that moment with AI. Absolutely. We'll talk about that. But I think at that particular moment, that was a B2C um, e-commerce uh, era when um, everyone, both consumers and investors, were looking for you know, who's the leader in the space. And, uh, and we were fortunate. Uh, we were very fortunate and um, you know, lucky to be alive during that period of time. Mm -hmm. Looking back at it now through um, you know, clear eyes and the dust is settled and you know, you're not part of that business any longer. Do you own any other stock in, in Getty anymore, or have you sold all of that as well? No, nope, I'm completely out. Completely clear. Other than you're saying potentially doing a 99-year lease of art.com, looking back at it, what do you think you could have done differently, or is there any regrets behind it, or are you just happy with how it all turned out? Well, I have a larger regret that I would share with Walmart, who's the owner of art.com today, and that is if God is good to you and you're lucky enough to have art.com is a URL mm -hmm. and you're you are the leader in this space I think that the world deserves more than prints and posters and you know inexpensive art gifts I think the art world is a big place and um, it would be great to leverage the potential power of the domain to be able to offer a gateway into other kinds of products and experiences yeah um, I didn't start the business on the basis that it was forever going to be a poster company. Mm -hmm. um, Art.com, relative to what we were, was aspirational. You know, we're selling posters, and we called it art, which is fine. It, it, it is. There's no, no problem. But it's now more than, uh, well, it's more than 25 years later. I think it's time to, to embrace the bigger opportunity that that... Um, domain represents or could represent mm -hmm. so yeah do you think do you think it's limited by Walmart because of the exact same issues you mentioned with suppliers and supply chain and you know like if you're gonna have a product on the shelves of Walmart you better be able to keep up with the volume of, of the product mm -hmm. they're probably gonna sell I right in the distribution yeah. that they deal with I think it's limited by the imagination vision of the people that leave the business mm -hmm. I don't I don't think I, you could make arguments about you know, how grounded is that broader vision in the, the narrower um, needs and interests of Walmart. Mm -hmm. But what I would argue is, um, if you sit back and think about this, how much better off would Walmart be if they open this thing up? They're only touching a small part of the potential. Yeah, always. There's a lot of assets that I see around that companies aren't using. I look at uh, loans.com is owned by Bank of America. 
and I check it from time to time, um, usually about once a year. I've contacted them saying I have clients who would love to own this name or lease sure. it from you. Yeah. It's just a dead page. Yeah. And it's amazing that they don't didn't even put through the biggest refinance boom, the lowest interest rates ever, sure. didn't put even just a lead generation page that right. would send to their loan officers. So they didn't do it. it. It blows my mind. It would seem that they should have a marketplace that's more like progressive. Yep. Right. That opens it up and says, "Hey, we're going to compete with everybody else. Come here. Right. This is what. This is the destination. Yeah. Come here first. Um, Do something. You yeah. know, anything. Yeah. It's well, strange. I think if we start from the premise that all the wrong people in life have the power. Yeah. <laughs> and that unfortunately, right. it's usually not us. Yeah. We'll save ourselves a lot of stomach lining if we just recognize that things don't always work the way they should. Yeah. Um, but for me as an entrepreneur, I've always had this sense of, I've had this very strong uh, reality distortion field mm -hmm. of how, but how should the world be? How could it be? And I've spent now the better part of my life pursuing what could be and um, you know, trying, to get a, trying to get some uh, validation by the outside world that, that I'm right about things. And when it happens, uh, that's great. It feels really good. It's like a comedian that's, uh, you know, that's, that's been killing, yeah. connecting with his audience. But it sure takes a lot of hard work as an entrepreneur to make that happen. Absolutely. You know, people see the success, but they don't know how many times you failed to get there. And Correct. there's little failures. Yeah. There's big mistakes, big failures, and, yeah. you know, it gets you there. I think. They, clearly, for me, the single best thing that ever happened was meeting my wife. And I've, I've had the benefit of a long marriage to a loving woman who's put up with me. And is, you know, in this thing as a co-venture, as a, you know, she's been along for the ride, the ups and the downs. And uh, whatever uh, challenges that I've had, a, she's been there. and. I think it's much harder for the spouse, I think. Um, you know, there's a lot of endorphins and emotions and psychological stuff that carries me through. It's not so easy to share with other people. And uh, anyway, it, entrepreneurship is tough, but if you, if you don't have a partner, a life partner that's, you know, in it with you, um, would make my life a hell of a lot harder. And I never could have done any of these things uh, without that support. So I'm lucky that I had the right mother who said, go for it mm -hmm. and don't count on my money. So it may be, be a little more uh, capital efficient maybe because of that. Of course. And then a wife who didn't quit on me every time I faced some kind of a significant challenge. So. And it's funny that you say that because a lot of the other entrepreneurs that I've interviewed and then other people that I've spoken to in my life say the same thing. It's it's a pretty common answer yeah. is saying that their wife is a major part of their success and that their support of having a supportive family is just as close and as important as well. And I think I think in my experience, my wife has seen, you know, sees how what it or I'm sure she does too, is just the body language and see how you're feeling after coming home after a long day and just seeing yeah. the way you're acting and knowing that it isn't just you're tired from work, like something really bad's going on or you didn't get that account or sure. your developer quit on you or your website's hacked or something bad or the good stuff comes home and surgery couldn't remove the smile from your face and it's the highs and lows of entrepreneurship and she's yes. there celebrating it with you and yeah. you know and crying with you too at the same time yeah. and feeling bad about it. And you're right, you can't Having a supportive wife, she's there that you can tell her yeah. your true feelings about everything. You know? I think the other thing is having a sense of equanimity about things, not letting the highs get too high or the lows get too low. Um, I've been doing this a long time now, and um, you know when things are tough, I've been at this long enough to know that there's a light at the end of the rainbow. Yeah. And when things are going great, and everybody's telling you how wonderful you are, and you know everything's it appears to be so wonderful. Bad times are coming. Yeah, <laughs> God, God is great about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just you know you 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 should not extrapolate on success. Yeah, it's like things are too good right now. I I yeah. need to prepare. Yeah, good.